So this is basically what they're doing, but they're doing it in 2016. You'll find that the attackers have been inside the network for months and sometimes years to be able to accomplish the things that Elliot's doing in a matter of hours in, in this case, right? Because this is a TV show, doesn't mean it's not real. <laughs> yeah, that's so. why you love the show, isn't it? Because it's, uh, it, it's really real. Hey everyone, David Bommel back with Occupy the Web. If you haven't seen our previous videos, he's the author of this book, Linux Basic for Hackers. And he's also got this book, Getting Started, Becoming a Master Hacker. Occupy the Web, welcome. Thank you, David. It's always good to be with you. Really looking forward to this. We've had a lot of great feedback about our Mr. Robot uh, videos. Uh, people are really enjoying them. So I'm hoping that we're gonna talk about another hack uh, today. Yeah, what I wanna talk about today is a hack that is going on at the end of season two, beginning of season three, and kind of give you some context for this. F Society and Elliot have basically encrypted all of the data of the world's largest conglomerate, Evil Corp. And so the world economy has collapsed <laughs> because of it. <laughs> and they're, they're having some regrets. But the Dark Army, which is the Chinese hackers, they want this to continue on. They, they want to continue to hack the uh, Evil Corp and make certain that the economy remains comatose. The next stage is to try to destroy all of the paper records because Evil Corp has determined that the only way to recover their business is to take all their paper records, which are voluminous, they're, and they're spread all over the US, is to bring them all to one warehouse and then try to restore the database, which is, you know, if you, for instance, if you were hit with ransomware and you couldn't break the ransomware, you would try to restore your backups. But remember that Elliot and his team had gotten into Steel Mountain and destroyed the tape backups <laughs> using their hacking Raspberry Pi where they got into the HVAC system, raised the temperature. It's tedious and time-consuming, but it's their only option. The folks at uh, the Dark Army and F Society have a plan to try to destroy the paper records. And this involves a little-known vulnerability in the uninterruptible power supplies or the UPSs. And just for those people who aren't familiar with that, I'm going to go and throw one up on the screen for you. Okay. So here's a, an APC, all right, Smart UPS 2200. You see it right here. These are, these are basically car batteries <laughs> with <laughs> electronics that store power and, and manage power into a computer system. So inside here, you're gonna find a lead acid battery. That's why it makes them so big and heavy. Uh, lead acid is you know, what often is used in vehicles, almost always used in vehicles for starter battery, right? Or marine batteries. And then there's electronic controls. So these controls manage the power and there's a small computer inside there that manages the, both the input and the output from this battery. Okay, so that if you get a brownout, then it goes and bumps up the voltage. If you have a blackout, it takes over and starts providing the uh, electricity for the computer system. In large corporations, they'll have entire rooms full of these, right? So if I've got, say, a data center at can't go down. I will have entire rooms full of these and that are meant to provide some backup power in the case that uh, there's a blackout or a brownout. So this is what F Society is attacking Evil Corp has in place in a warehouse in New York City. And that's where they're bringing all of the paper records. Here's kind of a the uh, one of the GUIs from one of the backups. This is another, this is a, this is APC. Okay. American power conversion. This is APC, by the way, is owned by Schneider Electric, the big SCADA, <laughs> the big SCADA company based in France. They bought American power conversion. American power conversion was an, is an American company that is probably the largest provider of these UPSs around the world. Yeah, they're all over the place. There, there, there are millions of them all over the world. You know, we get various, um, I got some other screenshots of 
some of their GUIs where you can manage the, uh, it's kind of like log files, okay, for the particular UPS, right? This is power event summary. So these are, you know, the things that are taking place. These are logged events. And you can see here, there's a frequent over voltage, okay, frequent under voltage. And this is what the little computer inside of these devices manages. Right? It's managing under voltage, over voltage. And if there's a power failure, right, then it takes over. If there's a low battery. So this is what's going on in terms of, of the computer that's based inside. And these are Linux based systems, right, that are inside these devices. We know that Elliot and team have put the femto cell inside of Evil Corp. And so we know that they are actually inside of the network. That means that they might be able, if they can pivot through the network and get through various firewalls, what have you, access the UPSs. And apparently, you know, in the in the show, they do it. And and they don't, this is not something that is really uh explained or gone into any great detail. And this would be one of the hardest parts of this hack is to be able to pivot through the network once you're inside it. But remember the femto cells inside the network and they were able to listen in on the conversation. They would use it to distribute malware to the FBI's phones. But once they're inside the network, then they can begin to work their way through the various networks inside of Evil Corp. Interestingly enough, uh, interestingly enough, in just this year, we had a whole bunch of vulnerabilities that were discovered within these devices. So this is like eight years after, six years after this hack takes place in Mr. Robot. If you haven't seen our previous video, I've linked it below, where Occupy the Web shows us that hack with a femtocell and discusses how Elliot was able to listen into the FBI calls. This just came out this year, uh, in March of this year. Multiple vulnerabilities in Schneider Electric APC Smart UPS. So this is basically what they're doing, but they're doing it in 2016. They're hacking these smart UPSs, and we've got a number of vulnerabilities. There's three of them that were discovered this year. It's possible that Elliot and his crew actually developed these, these hacks back then, but these are basically RCEs where they can do remote code execution within them, and they can upload new firmware to these devices. In the TV show, you know, they don't make any reference to these CVs, obviously, because they hadn't been found yet. Right? <laughs> so in the in the show, they make reference that they're going to upload the firmware, right? And this is possible as they pivot through the network and get to these UPCs. In 2014, when the Russians hacked the electrical grid of Ukraine in December of 2014, they also hacked the battery backup system. They they went ahead and hacked these too and wow. uploaded new firmware to these things. So my point I really want to emphasize here is that most people are overlooking this as a target, these uninterruptible power supplies as a target. But the Russian sandworm did not. They said, okay, if we're going to knock out the electrical grid, we need to knock out the power backup so that the operators can't get back onto their systems after the yeah. power goes out, right? <laughs> so they went in and did essentially the same thing is that the Russians did this in 2014. And then in 2015, or whenever they shot the show, 15 or 16, this is one of the things that was done in the show. And then in 2022, we've got a whole slew of new vulnerabilities that are found where outside attackers can go ahead and upload firmware, unauthenticated firmware to the UPC. So these are multiple paths to be able to do the same thing. I mean, Elliot's coming from inside the network. The new vulnerabilities are from outside the network. Remember that many of these more advanced UPCs actually connect to the call home. So when they need updates and upgrades, they got to call home. So that's the path, that's the vector that is used in the most recent 2022 remote code execution is that by basically emulating the, the web server of Schneider Electric, you're able to do an update to these that allows the attacker to take control of them. In the case of Elliot, what they did is they took 
control. They updated the firmware, okay, just like the 2022 attack, okay, just like the Russians did in 2014. Because this is a TV show, doesn't mean it's not real. <laughs> yeah, that's so, why you love the show, isn't it? Because it's uh, it, it's really real. Exactly. You know, it's uh, it's real. This is this had been done by the Russians. It's been done in in recent times. Different vectors by getting exactly the same thing by essentially updating, okay, the system firmware to take control. This is an area that's kind of on the cutting edge of hacking is updating the firmware or updating the software. You probably remember the Solar Winds hack just yeah. a couple of years ago, right? Solar Winds. What happened there is that the Russians were able to embed inside the update of the Solar Winds. Okay, Solar Winds is a network management tool, right? That Lots of people use. So they embedded malware inside of the update. So when everybody updated, they got the malware. And we've seen this being used increasingly in, in multiple hacks in recent years is to be able to emulate the uh, update. Oh, another good example of this is uh, in Stuxnet. Stuxnet in 2010, when that software was put onto those systems, it had to be updated. All right, so they were on. It was running Windows systems, and so the the NSA was able to essentially emulate Microsoft, okay, for the update. And they sent the up. They sent the update. Okay, so every every time your system, no matter what it is and what application, right? We all have all these applications running on our systems, and we all have Windows or Linux or Mac OS on our system. They all have got to be updated periodically, right? How do we know that the update is actually coming from the developer and not somebody else, right? Well, the way or we doesn't know, include. It doesn't include trash like the solar winds example, yeah. It, exactly. Well, the way we know is through digital signatures, right? And in the case of the the this APC smart UPS, the digital signature was flawed. That's why you can go ahead and update those systems, okay, okay. and run RCEs. In the case of Stuxnet, what they did is that they used a collision hash, a hash of a collision in 2010. So if you've got enough computing power, you can create collisions of hashes. So you know that a hash is a one-way algorithm. It's a one-way encryption, right? So it takes a, a bit of of a code or a number or a picture or what have you, you know, any type of binary data, and then encrypts it in a way that it, it can only go one direction. Most of the time we talk about encryption, we're talking about two-way encryption going both directions. So I encrypt something, then I decrypt it. Hashes are one way, and they just allow us to check the integrity of the information. So when you downloaded Kali Linux, you'll see that there is a SHA-1 hash next to it that allows you to check to see whether or not anything has changed in route to your system, and that somebody hasn't gone ahead and put some malware in place. So what the NSA, with a lot of computing power, was able to do is to create what's called a, a hash collision of the digital signature, which is, you know, not the rest of us can't do that. <laughs> they can because because they've got so much computing power that they can do that. I think that's kind of breaking the rules. I mean, because we all rely upon the system exactly. for digital signatures and they broke the rules and said, you know, your digital signature is has no value. And I, I think that's one of the areas where, you know, if you're going to question what the NSA is doing, that's one of the things that, that we have to question is that they have done something that makes us all question whether or not digital signatures are legitimate or not. In any case, that's part of the system. And that's how we know that when we get our updates and upgrades that they're coming from a, a the, 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 the company the developer who we purchased it from. But in some cases, in the case of this smart UPS, the digital signature is broken because of its improper implementation of TLS. It's really worrying about the NSA if they did that in 2010. What, what are they doing today? 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, all the all the paranoia amongst or paranoid amongst us. Well, we know that the NSA basically is gathering data on all the pipes. They have access to all the pipes, and so they're collecting all the data. And they'll say, "Well, you know, we're collecting all the data, but it's all metadata, and so don't worry." But you know, we all know, <laughs> we all know yeah. that if you have the metadata from many sources. Okay, you can correlate to get exactly who's doing what, where, and when, and that's what they want. They've got these huge data farms where they put all that data together, and because the IT industry, for instance, YouTube and Facebook, WhatsApp, what have you, are all based in the U.S., they have direct access to the the all of the channels of data coming through all of those major applications. You know, if, if it's if it's um, DK in Russia, they don't have access to that. I mean, they don't have access as well as they do to all of the U.S. apps. So you know, here I am sitting in the U.S., right? And I'm telling you that the NSA has access to all of those applications that are based in the U.S. That's why China has TikTok. <laughs> That's why Russia has VK, right? Because they don't want to give up that data to the NSA. So it's kind of got a little diversion there of, of NSA. But you're right. I mean, the NSA is always collecting data. And, you know, we can put a little plug in or against TikTok and that TikTok is, is all of your data on TikTok is going to the Chinese government. You know, just keep that in mind when you're watching your next TikTok video that the Chinese, the Chinese have are collecting all your data, right? You, you use TikTok all the time, right? <laughs> I don't use TikTok at all. Right. I mean, I don't I don't use TikTok all just for that reason. I don't want to give my data to the Chinese. Now you might think, well, the Chinese, you know, are they really a threat? Well, maybe not now, but they have effectively gathered data on much of the West. I mean, this is what they've been doing over the last couple of decades, is they have been gathering data. You, you see these hacks take place, and we know they're coming from China. And generally, the hacks just simply gather data. The Chinese are just building a huge database of everybody in the West. Right? What can you use that for? Well, we, there's lots of things you could imagine it might be used for in the future. And I personally don't want to give that my data to uh, to the Chinese. Now, you know, it's it's hard living in the United States and for most of us in the West not to have the NSA spying on our data. So, you know, I guess you have to choose what spy agency you're willing to give your data yep. to. Right? Uh, but in any case, let's get back to our Mr. Robot. Right, we'll t stop talking about the NSA and the Chinese and TikTok. Well, as I was, as I was saying, inside of these these uh, cases here, right down here, there's a car battery in here. Right, it's a lead acid battery, and if you ever picked one of these things up, you can vouch how heavy they are. Yeah, yeah. Lead acid batteries are cheap. You know, we all know that in our other devices, we have lithium batteries of various types, and they're more efficient and more expensive. But to keep the cost of these things low, they use car batteries. You know, this is a, a lead acid battery, right? The old style in the automobiles. If you've ever opened the hood of your car and looked at your car battery, you might have noticed that the terminals on your car battery sometimes are like a whitish or bluish color. They have a little corrosion on them. And that corrosion is caused by when the battery overcharges that it'll, it'll expel hydrogen gas. That hydrogen gas then is what causes the corrosions on those terminals. Of course, if you're into it, you can clean those terminals off and get better connection. But as we know, hydrogen gas is very flammable. And so Elliot knows this too. <laughs> so <laughs> so the, the, the plan here, and it's, it's Elliot and the Dark Army, the Chinese hackers, what they're going to do is to overcharge these batteries and when they overcharge, because they've now got control of the firmware inside of the UPS, and they're going to overcharge the batteries. And when the batteries overcharge, they start expelling hydrogen gas. 
Now, in your car, you know, that's not a problem because the gas just goes out into the atmosphere. There's no, there's no issue. But in these closely controlled environments, we all know that in these IT environments, we have to maintain temperature and humidity, and there's usually no windows open in them. You're going to have all of these UPSs now being expelling hydrogen gas. And if they can, if they can overcharge them enough, basically, they're going to have a room full of hydrogen gas. And all it takes then is a simple spark to set off that hydrogen gas and the building blows up. That's basically the hack. It ends up, I think, killing 73 people. So this is one of those hacks that is not just a, of a computer system, but it's a hack that actually kills people. Hacking can kill people. And let's be clear about this. You know, we've often thought about hacking of just taking control of computers. But when we start talking about hacking infrastructure, we start talking about power plants, electrical grid, UPSs. We're talking about human danger. We're talking about things that can actually kill a human being. And this is kind of the realm of cyber war. And this is these are the types of hacks that are going on now between the West and Russia. I mean, those of you who are paying attention to the Russia-Ukraine war probably note that there's been a lot of what the Russians refer to as mysterious explosions taking place yeah. in Russia. Mysterious explosions and fires. And people scratch their head and say, "How? what caused that? How did that happen? This would be one of those routes. Okay. So remember that when we're inside of an infrastructure facility, whether it be a refinery or a chemical processing plant, there's always the potential for fire and explosions. In any case, so that's kind of the way that Elliot did it. So hacking has, has kind of moved, at least in, in Elliot's world and in the real world as well, has moved from taking control and stealing data to actually causing physical damage. And in the case of cyber war, these devices can be used uh, to cause physical damage and harm human beings. In Mr. Robot, 73 people died in Russia, in the Russian-Ukraine war. We're seeing buildings being blown up by similar types of attacks. I mean, I think you've answered the question, but I always want to ask it. So Mr. Robot, in this case, how real is it? Is it like is it reality or is it just like a science fiction type stuff again? Well, there's a couple of problems that I have with this hack. Okay. One, okay, one is uh, the difficulty of moving from the femto cell, which is in like the headquarters building, into yep. to the warehouse network. You know, if you've ever tried to traverse networks within the same corporation, it's not easy to do. <laughs> and it might be one of those projects that's going to take you days or weeks, or months, maybe, okay? Going back to what I've said many times on your show, is hacking's hard work. It's not just pushing a button, using the right tool in the right place. You're going to have to spend a lot of time to figure out how to move from the headquarters building where the femto cell is at to the warehouse. And any reasonable security engineer is going to segregate those networks, right? And there's going to be firewalls in between. That's not an easy move to make. The second part of this hack that I think makes it more difficult is I don't know if there's going to be enough hydrogen gas to blow up that whole building. You definitely could yeah. create a fire. You could definitely create a fire, but whether or not you could explode the whole building with the gas that's expelled from these batteries is something I don't have a good, you know, a good feel for. I don't know how much gas is going to come out. And I don't know how many batteries are in there. Those are kind of the key questions I have regarding the, you know, the real realism of this attack. One is that it would take a lot longer to move from the corporate network to the warehouse network. It would be difficult to do into whether or not there's enough batteries to produce enough gas to blow up the building. But one thing I can say is that with these new, the new vulnerabilities that we know in these devices that came out this year, that I don't have to use the femto cell. But Elliot doesn't know that yet. In 2022, you can go directly into the battery without having to go through the network and update the firmware that way. But on the show, he explicitly says they're using the femto cell to traverse the network and get into the warehouse and then get into the, the UPSs. 
I think you've said it many times. It's like it's possible, but the timescales are always way off. Yeah, the timescales way off. I mean, trying to move from a the corporate network, you know, from the femto cell, and the femto cell gives them a foothold within the corporate network. But unless Evil Corp is really, really lax in their security, the warehouse and the corporate network are not going to be easy to divert, traverse across those networks. There's going to be multiple security devices in between. And that's not something you do in 24 hours. That's something yeah. that's going to take you days and weeks and maybe months. And in reality, you know, when you analyze some of the great hacks in history, the real world hacks, you'll find that the attackers have been inside the network for months and sometimes years to be able to accomplish the things that Elliot's doing in a matter of hours in in this case, right? So that's the kind of the, you know, the time frame is not realistic. The Stuxnet, how long did it take them to get that to, to happen? Three years. Took yeah. three years. To get and that's with like there. serious money and serious people behind it, right? That's with some of the best malware developers, hackers at NSA and Israel. Uh, working together, and uh, it took them three years. So just kind of keep that in mind, folks, that you know things don't happen on the YouTube uh, the Mr. Robot the time frame, right? <laughs> they, to really get into a system, it might take you years. And so don't get frustrated. Just find another method, right? Because yeah. there's always a way in. There's always, I will say this unequivocally, there's always a way in. It's up to you as the hacker to find the way in. And it, that's not always easy. It's not just, oh, here's the right tool and here's the right button. And then whoosh, I've got it. I've captured the system. It takes a lot of hard work. The really good hackers of the world, the people who've been doing this for you know years and years and years, sometimes it takes them years to accomplish their hack. It's amazing. I mean, it's you see like the recent hack of Uber at the time of this recording. Um, an 18-year-old managed to get in, but that was social engineering seems to have been the way that he got in. Um, and and that's true. I mean, he, he got in through social engineering. He got the password, got the admin password through social engineering. And let's not downplay social engineering. Social engineering is a key element of cybersecurity, right? Almost all of these great hacks of history have had a social engineering element. And I've said this before, is that you know, if you were to make a list of all the great hacks in, in the last, say, 10 or 15 years, almost all of them have a social engineering impact. He was able to accomplish you know, by being a good social engineer, what might have taken somebody else months and years, he did it in a matter of hours. Downplay, and I know you have a lot of good social engineering tutorials on uh, on your site, but a lot of young people want, oh, social engineering, that's, you know, that's for the people who aren't technical. Most of these hacks have both a technical and a social engineering element to them. So if Sandworm, which is the most advanced hacking group within Russia uses social engineering, you probably should consider it as well. It's not a downgrade from technical. Often you have to combine the two together to be able to be effective. Okay, by the way, I really want to thank you, you know, for sharing, you know, not just the stories of Mr. Robot, but also, you know, giving wisdom and experience to the people starting in the industry. So really want to thank you for sharing. Thanks, David. I always enjoy being on your show. 